September, fall, and we are here. This is the second um, to the last session. The next one will be in October, and we'll talk a little more about that towards the end. So welcome, everybody. We've got, I think, around 56 who have signed up, and we're now at 20 participants, so more people will be joining us. Um, and now I get to introduce the speakers, which I love to do. So Dr. Ellen Brown is well known to many people in our area. She's helped put hospice and palliative care on the map in Santa Clara County. Ellen was the former medical director of Pathways and is now an elder care consultant and uh, very busy in her life with um, clients and family. So welcome Ellen, um, who I think is now zooming in from Boston. Are you in Boston this morning? Yes. Okay. Mar Marblehead. Yeah. Marblehead. Okay. And also Dr. Rita Katex, psychologist. I met Rita when I was working at Stanford Hospital. At the time I met Rita, she was director of aging and adult services, and she is now the founder and director of Aging 101 and is also an elder care consultant and doing multiple services to our local a national and international community working on research, book projects, and also, also serving the local community. So today's topic is extremely relevant to what we've all been experiencing the past year with the pandemic on palliative and hospice care. And a lot of people are confused about the differences between the two, the cost, the coverage, and to consider thinking about it. So they're gonna present a very comprehensive discussion on this today. And we welcome your questions in the chat line, which we will um, get to, and we hope to address all of your questions. If we need to go over time a little bit, we, we can do that. Okay, thank you so much for joining. Here we go, Kat, PowerPoint. Oh, yes. Okay, we can, um, we can put up the first slide. Right. Can you see that okay? <clears throat> Perfect. Okay, awesome. So, um, I wanna welcome you all to our fifth session of Care Forum. Um, and before we get started with the formal presentation, I want to dedicate uh, today's session to my mother-in-law, Frances Brown, who actually passed away this morning at 3 a.m. on home hospice. So um, this topic is immediately close to my heart, both professionally as well as personally. Um, we wanna welcome all of you back. Um, we're grateful for the Avenidas management team uh, as, and as always to Paula Wolfson and Kat King for helping us with uh, a lot of the technical aspects and uh, for everything they help us with. Um, we're going to be continuing some of our themes from last month's forum. Uh, we're gonna be talking today about the strategies for care and, and these important conversations that take place in chronic illness, hospice and palliative care uh, and how important Important it is to have these conversations, especially during the pandemic, to have, and how important it was to have access to both palliative care and hospice during the pandemic. We're going to talk about how COVID might have changed these conversations, um, as well as what the differences are between palliative care and hospice and what's new in these areas. Thank you, Ellen. I am honored that you shared this difficult experience with all of us. I know you have been back in the East Coast and you know what it means for you to dedicate this to your mother-in-law. It puts everything we will talk about today in such great, great perspective. And yes, I'm grateful to be back again with you presenting the fifth session of Care Forum 2021. I want to second the welcome to all the participants today before we delve into this really important area. As I work with my patients, caregivers, and families, I realize that almost on a daily basis, the importance of palliative care in managing chronic disease is not highlighted. Next slide, please. So these are our objectives for today. Um, we want to uh, learn how hospice and palliative care uh, changed during the pandemic uh, and to understand the differences between hospice and palliative care, when each is appropriate and how to access them. The other objectives Ellen today are learning the importance of starting these conversations earlier in chronic illness and understanding strategies for communication with the health systems during the pandemic. 
Next slide, please. So I love this cartoon. Um, as a society, we tend to avoid discussions about death, end of life. And Rita, so many times these conversations take place during a healthcare crisis. Uh, and there are stressed, anxious family members and stressed uh, providers. Um, and the family members may not know what their loved one wants or the friends, the healthcare proxy may not know what their, um, uh, the, the person they're representing wants. What I love about this cartoon is that it says, it's okay to think about death and embrace life at the same time. Um, we know that this can be a really difficult balancing act. Our culture really doesn't like to deal with death, um, but COVID, it forced us to deal with death. People we knew were getting sick and some were dying. And we, you know, it's okay to live life to the fullest and still plan ahead. Yes. yes, Helen, in many ways, the pandemic took us completely by surprise. We were always aware of the fact that serious and chronic illness causes individuals to pass away in hospitals. You know, the research data is abundant. But discussions about death, palliative care and hospice made people understand that there were other options, that they could talk about their own wishes and decisions. However, as you know, the pandemic came so suddenly upon us. And as we know, the death toll was so remarkably high. I think it highlighted the concept of immediate discussions about advanced care planning and palliative care and hospice. Next slide, please. During COVID, palliative care teams in hospitals played an even bigger role than usual. They often were the ones comforting patients in the ICUs when family members were not allowed in and couldn't be present. Palliative care team members might have been the ones holding hands at the bedside while family members were on Zoom or on iPads. Many people began having conversations with family members or their health providers about even whether they'd want to be admitted to the hospital during COVID or instead choose to receive their care at home, possibly with hospice. Ellen, for healthcare professionals everywhere, I think COVID-19 has challenged us on all fronts. We are facing conversations that we never expected nor wanted to have. The relentless demand for care during the pandemic has pushed clinicians over the edge. We did not sign up for this. We have always counted on professionals like you who are experts in palliative care and hospice about these discussions, whether we were dealing with serious or chronic illness at home, elsewhere. In my daily practice of clinical care coordination, we were faced with these discussions, but COVID made all of these important topics like advanced care planning, those detailed discussions we talked about in our previous sessions, palliative care, hospice, rise to the top. As you mentioned for earlier, Ellen, we have always had difficulty talking about death, but in so many cases during the pandemic, people just went into the ICU and passed away and caregivers were taken completely unawares, oftentimes without even having those discussions ahead of time. And, and Rita, one of the things the pandemic made us acutely aware of is there aren't enough palliative care professionals mm -hmm. um, to have these conversations. Other providers need to be having these conversations as well. And the good news is there now is better reimbursement for primary care doctors and other clinicians to start these conversations. Many hospitals are now even requiring or, or requesting, not required, requesting their palliative care teams to train the other clinicians in the hospital. They want their entire workforce know how to have these um, trainings on how to have communications about serious illness. Uh, other MDs certainly need to be trained. It wasn't part of their medical training when they were in medical school. You know, how to start the conversation. Um, how to make sure people's voices are heard and their values are reflected in their end of life care. There is increasing recognition that finding out people's goals 
in the setting of serious illness is so important and that these early goals of care conversations are associated with better quality of life, care that is more in line with your goals and also reduced use of non-beneficial medical care at the end of life. Unfortunately, um, as I said, these communication skills were not always uh, taught when people were in, in training, but there is a lot of training going on now. Next slide, please. In my career, I've seen a lot of misunderstandings about what exactly palliative care is. Some people think it's reserved for just for the end of life or that it's the same as hospice. I was horrified to learn that in, in fact, in Chinese, uh, one of the definitions of palliative care was do nothing care. And a translation of hospice care was last minute care. Mm -hmm. So there are new suggested translations because we know language is important. And I love this new translation. Palliative care is a gentler, kinder approach to care. And hospice care's translation in the new version is care focused on comfort and peace. The pandemic helped people learn how helpful palliative care could be, whether you were sick in the hospital or dealing with serious illness at home. And when people are explained what palliative care actually is, there was a recent survey that said three quarters of them wanted it after it was explained, but most of them had no idea what it actually was. Yes. And then this has been a common feature in inpatient settings as well as in nursing facilities. Many times when faced with a serious or chronic situation, if the medical team has suggested palliative care, the family or the caregiver has immediately felt overwhelmed and stated, we are not there yet. In my own experience, many older adults have come home with palliative care and with those extra home health services that accompany palliative care, and they have done quite well. I really like your statement, Ellen, that palliative care as a gentler, kinder approach to care and hospice care as care focused on comfort and peace. Next slide, please. Rita, as we mentioned before, it is so important to convey one's wishes to their healthcare team and that we realize one's health, one's wishes can change over time as one's circumstances change. This was highlighted by the pandemic. Many people's previous documents had said they would be willing to go to the hospital for necessary care. And some of these same people who had previously considered hospitalization were now adamant. They wanted to remain at home and they wanted to make sure they could get good quality care at home. Once somebody was admitted to the hospital, these conversations between caregivers and loved ones and caregivers and clinicians were often only able to take place virtually or over Zoom. Now, clinicians learned over time how to have some of these important goals of care conversations virtually, but it was a, a learning curve. They had to learn how to establish rapport virtually, um, you know, how to make eye contact. There was so much that had, because these are critical conversations. And originally people were afraid they couldn't get the point across if it was done virtually, but we've learned. Right, Ellen, remember you and I spoke about just when the pandemic started, there were several of our patients who were in nursing facilities in the hospitals and people were just scrambling how to get to them, how to talk to them. So this continuous talking to the team was so important, making them understand as you have always stated, care is like a continuum. We move from wellness to illness and to serious illness. However, it is extremely important to make decisions when one is well and able to think clearly. Ellen, you and I have constantly emphasized this piece when we speak with patients and families that planning ahead, having these conversations are so important. In the crisis time, when there is an emergent crisis, 
it is very hard to make these kind of decisions and then it becomes an emergency. Repeated hospitalizations, onset of new symptoms can change the conversation. Ellen, I'm reminded of a family that I was working with for the longest time and the older adult I was working with had cardiac illness with significant kidney disease. As time went by and there were multiple hospitalizations, I remember visiting them in the hospital a few times. The older adult himself started discussing about not undergoing more care, but expressing an interest in stopping aggressive care. I do recall the family was taken aback and did not know how to either respond or how to proceed. A conversation with the primary care physician, myself, caregiver, led them to the discussion of palliative care. I recall the palliative care team coming in, it was a very powerful discussion and explaining very effectively the management of symptoms and how that would help. They painted that big picture. Next slide, please. So let's start with what do we mean when we talk about chronic and serious illness? Rita, one definition I like is, serious illness is a health condition that carries a high risk of mortality and either negatively impacts a person's daily function or quality of life or excessively strains the caregiver. It might be cancer, heart disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or dementia. Chronic disease or illness is defined as a condition that lasts one year or more and requires ongoing medical attention or limits activities of daily living or both. And chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer and diabetes are some of the leading causes of death uh, in the US. And then we have discussed this often, you know, between ourselves and other colleagues that the health system often fails many people with progressive chronic illness in whom the end may be approaching, reflecting a failure to think proactively about their care. I always see the problems when managing chronic conditions becomes difficult and deteriorating health conditions lead to decrease in dependence, frailty, even family burden. These problems are mitigated by the limited resources of the individual disposal and the availability of support from hospitals and community services. I have experienced this with both my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, just like you know, you have experienced the, the, the recent events. Some clinicians describe difficulty in talking openly with the patient and family regarding their decline and the role of palliative care. Next slide, please. So let's take a deep dive into what palliative care actually is. Rita, it's an extra level of support that focuses on relieving suffering and improving quality of life for those who are coping with serious illness. It's provided by a team and it doesn't replace your own healthcare team. There are other names for it, I think um, in a bid to try to get people to accept it when they didn't understand it, uh, various teams have come up with these names, supportive care, pre-hospice care, pain management team. Sometimes it's trying to get past people's reluctance to accept palliative care because they associate it so closely with hospice. But there's lots of evidence when provided early, people feel better and they may actually live longer. And what many people don't realize is that while you're receiving this palliative care, which provides this extra support, you can be receiving your curative treatment at the same time. Thank you, Ellen. I think it was you who advised us. And for a long time, my father-in-law was also in palliative care and did so well. It is important to note that all hospitals have an inpatient palliative care team. Many times a physician who's in the process of discharging someone may refer the family to the palliative care team while they're still within the hospital to come and discuss how to manage symptoms once they leave. We have always encouraged these kind of good discussions. 
And I have personally been part of some of these discussions where the families have listened to the palliative care team and discussed among themselves. These discussions are indeed very helpful. They guide the family through the entire big picture of what to expect next, symptoms, diagnoses, prognosis, and so on. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, palliative care is provided by a team, a team of doctors, nurses, uh, social workers, and chaplains who can provide the medical, emotional, and social support needed to cope with the burdens of serious illness from both the patient as well as their caregivers and, and, and family support. And as I also said, some people are very afraid that they're gonna lose the connection with their own doctor, but the palliative care team works with your own doctor and doesn't replace them. In addition, they are experts at managing so many of these symptoms that accompany serious illness, pain, shortness of breath, nausea, or fatigue. They also are experts at starting those difficult conversations to find out what's important to you and make sure you, the care you receive is in alignment with your goals. And then through these sessions, I have often discussed with our audience the experience I have faced in my own personal life with my father-in-law who lived with us. And the last seven years of his life was restricted to his room and almost bed bound. We realized that after a few hospitalizations, the palliative care, care team came to speak with my husband, his only child, and we saw the rich benefits of having this team come in with home health services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, wound care, as well as the amazing richness of having the social worker speak to us about the different aspects of care. Next slide, please. So the, when the palliative care team are, are trying to have these important conversations with you, these are some of the questions they might ask. What gives you joy? Given that your time may be short, how do you wanna spend it? What worries you? And then by knowing what worries you, they can help you address some of your fears. When I've had these conversations with people, Sometimes they're not expecting this, these type of con uh, questions, especially from a doctor, but I leave plenty of time for silence and people uh, are able to open up if they want to. No one is ever forced to answer these questions, but often uh, they want to share what gives them joy or how they may want to spend their remaining time. So by allowing for silence, um, and also uh, giving people a safe place to discuss these very personal issues, um, I found can be very fruitful conversations. Ellen, this concept of listening in silence, compassionate listening and just being there is so powerful. We often you know, want to solve problems and we often want to say it will be okay, but just listening, as you just said, is such a powerful, such powerful advice. I would like to share with you a case study of someone that I've been helping and with a relatively grim cancer diagnosis as well as unresolved atrial fibrillation. This individual has often said to me, Rita, what gives me joy is the ability to be as independent as I can be. However ill I may be, sit at my desk, do some work and watch the greenery from my home. He has this beautiful glass windows that he looks out and the beautiful trees. If I'm unable to do these things and just limited to hospital trips with a poor quality of life, then I would like other options. This message allowed me the opportunity to have a family meeting. And then after discussions with the health providers, their PCP and other family members, he was referred to palliative care. Next slide, please. Studies have shown that there are many benefits for people who receive palliative care. For people with serious illness who do not wanna spend time in the hospital, studies have shown they do actually spend less time in the hospital. Their pain is better managed 
and they've been shown to have less anxiety and depression. They've also been shown to enroll in hospice earlier and get more benefits from being on hospice earlier uh, in the earlier stages of a terminal illness. And then we often get asked this question about when is the best time for a referral to palliative care? And recognizing you as the expert, let's delve into some of these. What are some of these? Next slide, please. All right, let's talk about some of the guidelines for referral to palliative care. And these are some guidelines that you can certainly think about. And these are guidelines that clinicians think about when it's appropriate to refer. So while you need a referral from uh, somebody in the medical system, you can always ask for a referral. You can ask your primary care doctor, you can ask a specialist for a referral um, for palliative care. And I often recommend um, to uh, people I know when they have serious illness and they're in the hospital, ask for a palliative care consult. So, you know, I realize when someone is dealing and right in the middle of a serious illness or a chronic illness, it's hard to know what is the best care and uh, to receive at what points. And so these are some guidelines just to think about. Um, the guidelines include the new diagnosis of a life limiting illness um, and you need help with symptom control or the patient and family need extra support. And because you can still receive curative treatment, it's been shown to really help with palliative care earlier uh, in, in the course of the illness, not waiting till when there's no um, curative treatments left. Other guidelines include declining ability to complete activities of daily living in the setting of a serious illness. Because again, a member of the team, like a social worker, can, can help and um, help caregivers as well as the person deal with this change in function. Um, other guidelines include um, significant weight loss, progressive metastatic cancer, or even two or more hospitalizations in the last three months. These are excellent guidelines, Ellen, and I think we have a few more which are included in the toolkit, as Ellen said. Next slide, please. Right, so we, we will, um, all of uh, these guidelines are included in the toolkit you will receive uh, after this talk. Um, but these are, these are some other guidelines that um, people can think about. Um, when the patient, the family, or the, the doctor uh, have a lot of uncertainty regarding the appropriateness of certain treatment options, um, sometimes it helps to have the palliative care team to really try to tease out what the, what the person wants and, and is the treatment in line with their goals. Um, often there's a family meeting. Uh, when there are these difficult to control physical or emotional symptoms, again, the palliative care team are experts in symptom management. Sometime when there's conflict with the treatment team, um, whether it's over DNR orders, specific treatments, the palliative care team can come in and try to resolve this conflict. I think Ellen, that is such an excellent um, you know, tip that you just gave because I've seen in many cases when the family does have, have not been able to focus on a common goal or have conflicts, the palliative care team has helped. Also to be considered, Ellen, is the limited social support in term, in sight of a serious illness, such as homelessness, no family or friends, chronic mental illness, and overwhelmed family caregivers. So we have considered a few guidelines for referral. But before we start the next topic of hospice care, Ellen, I wanted to share with our audience some of the other guidelines we have included in the toolkit. We call these the care transitions, and they are outlined systematically in your toolkit that just helps recognize the caregiver's role and responsibilities as we move through this whole gamut of care, whether it is the time of diagnosis or when new symptoms emerge, the complexity of bringing a patient or a loved one home, what does it mean to buy more home care? How do we support them? How do we support changing goals, placement, 
again, moving into the very depths of palliative care and hospice. So for each of these stages, caregivers need a lot of support. And we have tried to itemize some of these in the, in the toolkit. Next slide, please. So we're going to move now into talking more about hospice care, which is really a specialized type of palliative care available to people with an incurable illness and a life expectancy of less than six months. It doesn't focus on one's death. In fact, you know, I sometimes people imagine that's all that people who work in hospice do is talk about death, um, but really more about living well until you die. Um, it focuses on caring and quality of life and not curing. These are people who have chosen to, um, either the curative treatments are no longer working or there's too much burden or um, no benefit to these treatments and they've stopped their curative treatments. Um, and one of my favorite questions that I like to ask patients uh, when I go for a hospice visit is, you know, in the limited amount of time you have left, what do you want to do? What do you like to do? And how can we help you accomplish that? So again, it's a similar question to palliative care. It's a similar type of care, but it's further down one's timeline. It's focusing on people who have only days, weeks, or months, up to six months to live. Hop hospice care is really about giving people and their caregivers the necessary information, the medications, and the supplies to care for a patient with a terminal illness at home, about being prepared for what might be coming, but at the same time, supporting people's hope. You know, I sometimes hear, I don't wanna talk about hospice or I don't wanna talk about death. I don't wanna take away someone's hope. And what I learned is that there are many things that people can hope for even when they have a terminal illness. And while um, a cure may not be possible, sometimes they hope for being at home when they die, or they hope that they can be pain-free, or they hope that they can be with their grandchildren in the time they have left. So I think it's more about reframing hope and not taking away hope. Exactly, Ellen. And, 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 and the motto as in, in hospice, we're always saying, we're always hoping for the best, but it's important to be prepared for the worst. I agree, Ellen. And I think that I've been so privileged to be on the side of many older adults that have passed. And I've seen the amazing support that hospice services bring to the caregiver. I mean, the caregiver is at the center of our talk today and what it does for the caregiver to prepare them, to help them, and exactly what you said that there is hope that you can have even while you're living with terminal illness. Next slide, please. And similar to palliative care, hospice care is also provided by a team of a doctor, nurse, social worker, chaplain, home health aide, and volunteer. Um, hospice care can provide uh, more home health aid support um, Similar to palliative care, it treats the emotional and spiritual pain in addition to physical pain. Um, and we talked, Rita and I talked earlier in one of the care forum sessions about the caregiver being part of this new unit of care. And hospice care addresses that, as does palliative care. It addresses the emotional needs of caregivers too. They're there to support caregivers who are dealing with uh, the brunt of a loved one um, with a terminal illness. And then another question I often get asked, and I remember very recently uh, at Stanford being asked this, that is there an actual hospice facility where my loved one would go? It is important to note that hospice is a type of care, as you have mentioned, Ellen, that can be done anywhere. It can be done at home, in a nursing facility, if the family cannot accommodate the loved one in the home, or oftentimes, as we see in the home setting. I've seen a great shift in hospice care in the home setting in the last many decades, where the family can surround the older adult in their own loved environment. You're right, Rita. Hospice is provided um, uh, uh, where the person is living. 
Mm -hmm. um, it can be the home, assisted living facility, a skilled nursing facility, a convalescent home. Uh, in this country, there are also uh, a small minority of hospice patients that receive their care in an inpatient hospice. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one of the things we said, well, how do I get hospice care? How do I, you know, it requires a doctor's order, but a family or patient can always request the order from their doctor um, or request an informational visit from a hospice, you know, but um, uh, the hospice can't officially start until they get that doctor's order. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of myths about hospice and some of these myths act as barriers for people to get hospice care. Uh, and they contribute to the low acceptance or the refusal of some people to actually accept hospice services. One that Rita already mentioned is that hospice is a place. I have to move, I have to go somewhere to get hospice service. But that's not the case in the US. Other countries have many more institutional hospices. But in the US, it's a type of care that goes to where you live. <laughs> Another myth, Ellen, is that hospice care is just for the very end of life. So many times we've heard, I'm not ready for hospice. I'm not dying. But in reality, people can benefit from hospice services when they have months to live. Something else I've heard from people is that, oh, if you sign up for hospice, you're signing your death warrant. Um, you're going to die quickly. And in reality, uh, about nationwide, about 15% of people actually graduate from hospice. They get better and they no longer qualify or no longer appear to be in their final six months um, of hospice. The uh, average that people stay on hospice uh, nationally uh, is about two months. Although unfortunately there are a large proportion of people who come onto hospice so late um, mm -hmm. when they're actually starting their dying process, they, they only have hospice for maybe a, a week. Next slide, please. Let's talk about a few more myths, Rita. Um, one of the things I sometimes hear is hospice is push morphine and hasten death. Um, but there's no evidence at all that hospice shortens life. And there are some studies that show it may even prolong life when people's pain or shortness of breath or nausea are well controlled and they actually have a good quality of life, they tend to live longer. But morphine, as I said, it, it usually is prescribed in very low doses um, and no evidence that it uh, shortens life. And then some people think that hospice care is expensive. However, it is truly a valuable benefit from Medicare and does not cost it is also covered by medical and private insurance, but there are some things that are not covered. For example, medications that are curative or not related to the terminal disease, some over-the-counter medications, the round-the-clock care that you may need, those are some of the areas that are not covered by insurance. You know, but it, it is funny. It's one of the best uh, benefits in, in Medicare for the people who have Medicare. Exactly. Um, in fact, my sister-in-law this morning made the comment, oh my goodness, we received more than two months of hospice for my mother-in-law and it was free. It is like the, you know, the services you need, um, the comfort medicines, the supplies, the equipment, the nursing visits, the social work visits, the middle of the night visits. With Medicare, you don't pay a penny for that. Um, however, as you said, there is a major shortcoming and some people are told, oh, hospice will provide all the care you need. Um, it's gonna cover around the clock care. And that is not true. Um, Hands-on bedside care needs to be provided by family, friends, or private aides. Hospice will send in a home health aid anywhere from one to seven days a week, but that health aid comes for about an hour and may give a bed bath um, or help with the shower but if somebody needs four hours or eight hours or round the clock um, care from an aid, that is not covered by the hospice benefit. Yeah. Rita, I think. I think the next slide, please. Oh. So 
once we end our conversations on palliative care and hospice, Ellen and I wanted to touch on something really important, which is culture. We talked about culture in our last session as well. A very common theme that keeps coming up in the hospital setting is the role of culture in medical decisions. Having gone through at least three hospice situations with my own parents and in-laws, there are so many differences in culture and belief and death and dying and the communication style of our health providers, what do we believe in, how these conversations are continued, and so on. Doctors should be aware of their patients' beliefs about death and dying. Don't you agree, Ellen? Definitely, Rita. I, I, and doctors may certainly be unaware of their patients' beliefs about death and dying unless they ask. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's the term cultural competency and cultural humility, and, and they're very different. Cultural competency um, recognizes that healthcare needs to take in one's culture uh, and, uh, and cultural considerations when people are doing clinical decision-making. Cultural competent care respects diversity um, and it respects the cultural factors that affect health, um, such as language, belief, communication style, uh, behavior, but cultural humility goes one step further. It's really about having a very humble and respectful attitude toward people of another culture. It helps us recognize our own cultural biases. Often they're hidden. And it requires a willingness to learn from others. You know, when I go into someone's home, I'm, I'm gonna ask them, how does your family view illness? How do you, you know, what, what are the treatments in your, in your family or culture? Um, how, you know, how do you view death or what are the rituals that your family uh, have surrounding death? Because I can't assume everybody believes the same thing that I do or that my attitude or culture is best. There used to be this saying, you know, in Western medicine that West is best. And we, with cultural humility, we have to let go of that a little bit. There, where there's a lot we can learn from other cultures, especially the importance in end of life care when it, culture and ritual plays such an important role. And especially, you know, I can't stress this enough when it comes, um, it has to do with serious or terminal illness. You know, Death and dying are universal parts of life, but the way people understand death, the way people respond to death, they're shaped by their attitudes, their beliefs, their family life, the way they grew up. One example of this, and this is really important, is um, how we disclose a terminal prognosis. And in Western healthcare, we value patient autonomy um, and truth telling. And there's this um, a stress or a bias of always telling people everything. Um, and what I've learned that in some cultures, people don't want to know. And so one of the ways that I always find out if they want to know is I ask them, you know, who makes the decisions about healthcare uh, in your family? Who do you want us to be talking to when we have health information? Do you want to know everything? Or would you rather we discuss it with somebody else? Um, there are some cultures where, and I've had people tell me, I want to know everything. I can't make an assumption because they're a, a, a member of a certain ethnicity or culture that they don't want to know or that they do want to know. I need to ask. But I've had some people tell me, I don't want to know. Tell them, discuss it with my older son. Mm -hmm. Discuss it with my children. Um, mm -hmm. And we really shouldn't be forcing information on somebody who doesn't want to know. Ellen, this is such an important area and I think we are learning daily. Having gone through so many different situations, even in the inpatient setting with hospice, we recognize the powerful role of culture. Though nationwide, there has been a great shift in terms of learning more about cultures and their impact on healthcare, these powerful conversations, patient outcomes, and so on. Multiple studies are going on about how to train existing staff about the cultural sensitivity. 
the importance of asking these questions. What matters, what does not matter? And Ellen, like you said, cultural humility requires one to really listen to the patient and find out what they think. A 2015 study of close to 1500 physicians found that nearly all reported difficulties conducting end of life conversations with patients, especially those with a different ethnicity than their own. And, and Rita, the, the problem is especially acute among mm -hmm. minority populations. Right. There was a study that found that palliative care physicians were less likely to have conversations about prognosis with black or Latino patients compared to other patients. And when they did have these conversations, they were more than eight times less likely to have optimistic prognoses compared to others in similar situations. We also know that um, fewer African-American and Latino um, patients use hospice services than the percentage of whites. It's about 33.8% of whites in this country versus about a quarter of African-Americans and 28% Latino. We need to figure out, you know, is there distrust? Are we explaining it right? You know, there have been studies when it's explained by a physician of the same uh, ethnicity, um, there is more trust. So there's a lot of work to be done in this field um, and certainly in the realm of end of life care when these conversations are so important. Next slide, please. So Ellen, as we come to the end of our session, we would like to leave our audience with some tips and summaries. And of course, we are available for any questions. Uh, they can email us or ask us. Also to remind everyone how the pandemic changed this very complex topic of palliative care and hospice. And we are still in the pandemic. We have discussed a very complex topic that needs a great deal of ongoing support ongoing coaching, ongoing dialogue. It also brings us back to our earlier sessions of constant communication with the clinical teams and the family members and having these conversations early. We had discussed advanced care planning earlier and we continue to advocate for these conversations, having a designated proxy, reaching out if you're a solo ager, to someone that will be your voice and have all documentation ready. And so much changed in the, certainly in the hospice world during the pandemic. You know, it's, it's hard to think back to 2020, you know, March, April, mm -hmm. May, June, and those early months in the pandemic when hospices were reporting inadequate supplies of PPE, decreased access to patients, uh, and families who had so much increased bereavement needs, but um, there was just less staff. Staff weren't, you know, this was before the vaccine. People weren't able to always do in-person visits. You know, the access to loved ones in the hospital that for a while in some parts, some states uh, earlier this year, uh, were starting to allow people back in the hospital. And then it's changed once again in some states where again, they're they're limiting the visitors in the hospital. The increased use of iPads to have conversations with loved ones when they were in the hospital. Um, one thing that the pandemic highlighted was certainly the importance of these conversations, uh, how to make sure people got the care they wanted, the treatment they wanted. Um, and certainly the conversations changed. We remember early in the pandemic when we had no treatments and that's such a high mortality. I remember the statistics, if you were um, elderly with comorbid conditions and you were on a ventilator, the mortality was about 98, 99%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one year later, we do have better treatments. The mortality isn't as bad. And so it requires ongoing conversation. It's still not, you know, you know we know more a year later um, people who've been vaccinated uh, have less severe disease, but it may require an up, you know, changing conversations. The more information you have, it can influence the conversation you're, have, you're having. Mm -hmm. 
And Ellen, one big change that has come, you know, because of the pandemic and is probably here to stay is the use of telehealth. Even today, we are use, using telehealth constantly for not only treatment, for discharge, for ongoing management of chronic and serious illness. So telehealth is definitely here to stay and it has an increasingly important role in the pandemic, especially with discussions of palliative care and hospice. So, and it's interesting, certainly um, earlier in the pandemic, the government made it easier for physicians and clinicians and other, you know, healthcare workers to use telehealth in mm -hmm. terms of um, reimbursement, in terms of security. Um, there's a lot of education on how to use telehealth correctly. Um, it's certainly, you know, not everyone has access. Um, not everyone found it easy to use, but it got better and easier over time. Um, there were a lot of waivers put in place that um, things that could happen that were, doctors weren't, didn't used to be allowed to do over telehealth, there were waivers. And we're hoping that those waivers become permanent changes so that telehealth can stay. Um, there was a worry, you know, how do I establish rapport via uh, telehealth? You know, how do you have eye contact? You know, we said earlier how important silence was, but via telehealth, when doctors left too much room for silence, people thought they were having technical difficulties. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, when you do it virtually, you allow for just a few moments of silence instead of a long pause. Um, so we, we've gotten much better with telehealth and it had, did solve a problem uh, in terms of getting access to having those conversations. Um, not everything happened, has to happen in the doctor's office. Um, so that was a positive outcome of the pandemic. Um, we are certainly going to be open for questions. There was a lot we covered today. Um, the toolkit that you will be receiving has a summary of pretty much the highlights of everything we said. So even after we're gone and this, uh, th there will be a recording of this talk, we you certainly can listen to again, but the toolkit will cover the highlights. Um, and uh, so we're open for questions. So, next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, next slide. So Ellen, we wanted to remind everybody that the last session will be on discharge planning and we intend to cover again the chaos that can happen during discharge, how to bring some amount of normalcy in that process, what it leads to once again, touching upon the unit of care and so on. So now we are open to questions. Paula, you had to say something. We yes, have a question. I was gonna. I didn't know if that was a call to then present questions. So, uh, going back to palliative care, and I think this can also apply to hospice care. It has to do with dementia and Alzheimer's caregiving, and somebody with uh, frail older age and and really diminished activities of you know not able to do, not able to care for self. So, is palliative care appropriate for somebody with uh, advanced? or mid-stage dementia and Alzheimer's and low level of functioning? So, but I, I'm reading that question differently, Paula, because okay. it doesn't say ADLs, it says IADLs. Okay. So, which is more like balancing a checkbook or shopping or, so I, the answer is maybe. I mean, certainly in the guidelines, they talk about people who are having some decline in their ADLs or their activities of daily living. Um, walking, bathing, transferring. Um, but it, I think it would be a good idea to get a consult, to get the input from palliative care. They may um, be able to have really helpful tips and provide the support to the person as well as their caregiver. They may just, palliative care teams are stressed very thin, so they may not be able to provide ongoing support, but by all means, you know, in terms of getting their, a, a referral, a consult, getting help and finding out even what to expect to maybe even have some of those important conversations that you can have in middle stage Alzheimer's. Um, again, depending, middle stage is, is broad, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. I believe a consult would be helpful, but they may not be able to qualify for ongoing care. And then a question uh, that came to my mind as you were talking, um, because I've gotten phone calls on this when somebody actually graduates from hospice, the families um, are then under a huge amount of stress about 
what do they do? What's next? Because the person still requires a lot of care. So would one go back to palliative care? Yes. <laughs> so now the, the issue becomes um, where they get their health care system. Um, so uh, one of the things I was involved with, uh, with hospice discharges, because those are painful for family. Well, put it, they can be painful. Sometimes they're, it's really good news. Sometimes it, there's a pulling away of a lot of the support that the hospice provided. And so we would go out of our way to see, does someone qualify for palliative care? Um, with PAMPS, certainly their palliative care team would be open to somebody who's being discharged from hospice. Um, Stanford, I, it's just not available to everyone yet in, the, in, in our area, um, but somebody who has graduated from hospice still generally has huge needs for ADL, huge needs for support for family caregivers or the person themselves. So yes, I would definitely try to get on to a palliative care service with a hospice discharge and to discuss it with the hospice team. Hospices are supposed to provide a family with enough time for a safe, seamless transition off of hospice. Because it, as you said, it, it, families are left with still requiring a lot of support, emotional support, usually su needing equipment, um, needing a lot of things, but the person no longer seems to be in their final six months of life but they still have a serious life-limiting illness. Right. And then about grief support. Um, I've been told by many of my clients and friends and family that hospice usually offers like a year of grief support to um, the main family caregiver. Is that true? Uh, yeah, yes. And I actually feel like if my, bere my bereavement coordinator would be scolding me because I did not mention the wonderful services of bereavement that, that is not as robust with palliative care, it, but it is mandated to be part of hospice services. I mean, medic, because hospice is a Medicare benefit, it's much more regulated than palliative care. There currently are guidelines for what constitutes an excellent palliative care team or service, but it's not regulated by Medicare. It's not regulated by insurance yet, it, it's coming. Hospice, it's, it's mandated who makes up the hospice team, how soon each member of the team has to visit after somebody is enrolled in hospice. And yes, the bereavement services that are mandated to be, you know, for um, usually 13 months after somebody passes away because that one year anniversary of the death can be ex extremely painful. And the bereavement services um, can be really helpful through that time. Now. Even though Medicare mandates that a hospice provide bereavement, it doesn't say what that bereavement um, consists of. And that varies from hospice to hospice. Some hospices um, might give you a pamphlet and refer you to a, another hospice for bereavement services. Um, mm -hmm. But there are other hospices that have really um, memorial services, one-on-one -on -one counseling, group support groups, for children who have lost a, mom, a parent or people who have lost a mother or parents who have lost a child. Um, there's a whole range of bereavement support that uh, a hospice provides, but um, each hospice will provide something different. Ellen, I wanted to mention that, you know, Paula, as per your question, there have been so many families that have come and told me that, you know, once the person, the, the loved one has passed away, the amount of support they got, even at the time of death, where to go, how to find the funeral services, how to get everything, you know, all the details to be taken care of, plus the ongoing support. It is incredible. And I so, think that yeah. it, is, it is something, and I have to say that in cases where people have passed on and have left younger children, they have provided so much information and support for even those. So I think in, in a way, it is such a comprehensive benefit we have in this country. It's, it's unbelievable. That's so true. And then um, about coverage and costs. I want to just go back to that conversation because I, I know it's complicated. But just to clarify, um, hospices, palliative care, their strategies, they can be in your home, a care community, a skilled nursing facility. However, the room and board of having going into an inpatient hospice or having hospice in a skilled nursing home or a care community I believe it's the patients, whatever yes. the other insurance have long-term care, 
or private pay, that still has to go for the room and board. Because yes. hospice Medicare coverage is for the visits and the consults with the team. Correct. Right. Okay. So that's an important distinction to me. Right. Yeah, right. The only the, we we didn't go into the the um, sort of nuts and bolts, but so hospice will provide um, respite care. Palliative care does not provide paid respite care. Um, five days at a time in a skilled nursing facility or in a hospice facility, totally free, but it's five days of respite when the caregiver requires that respite. Um, it can, and it can be five days, then you need, then after the five days are up, if somebody needs to stay longer, then the family would need to provide that or they would go home, they could come back at another time for another five days of respite. Hospice can also would cover if somebody's symptoms were out of control and there's no way that they tried their best, they couldn't manage it at home and the person needed to go into either a hospice unit or a skilled nursing facility to get skilled care to manage their symptoms. And in that instance, the hospice would be paying the room and board costs, but only for the, the short period when the symptoms were out of control. For the okay. regular room and board costs, it does not pay. That's correct. Okay, thank, thank you. I know we have one hospice house in Redwood City. I think it's a mission hospice house, which is a yes. totally dedicated for inpatient care. But when you say inpatient unit, you're talking about Right, so, so the hospice house is not a skilled inpatient unit. As far as I, as I know, I, I, I don't wanna give the wrong information. So the VA hospital has an inpatient hospice unit. When mm -hmm. it first opened, it was for everyone. Now it's pretty much restricted to veterans who um, uh, there are, San Francisco has, a, um, uh, uh, um, oh, I'm blocking, Com um, Zen hospice unit closed, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Hospice, inpatient hospice units in this country, unless they are heavily supported financially by donations, are, have a very hard time um, staying okay. in business. Staying so open. Zen hospice yeah. used to be a hospice unit, that's gone. Coming home hospice in San Francisco has an inpatient hospice unit. Um, uh, there are, there, there are not that many in the Bay Area, which is unfortunate. Um, there are other parts of the country which have a few more, and it's for people. Sometimes there's there's no caregiver who can provide the care, or and there's no funds. Uh, so going into an inpatient hospice unit to provide necessary care when symptoms are out of control is wonderful. In in our since we don't have um, designated inpatient hospice units in our area, people would go like you can go into Stanford Hospital for a short stay on hospice to get your symptoms under control and then you would be discharged back home. You could go into some skilled nursing facilities that have a contract with the hospice to get your symptoms under control, and then you would go back home. Hospice Home, I was working on somehow getting some way to do that. I don't know if they, if they currently have that ability. Okay, well, thank you for all those clarifications. Um, so I just wanted to ask our participants, if, if we, there are any questions, please post them. Otherwise, I mean, we'll be that a few minutes to come in. Um, otherwise, you can certainly contact Rita and Ellen and myself. We all do similar kind of consultation work and uh, we're available to you. Um, and you will be receiving a copy of the video and the toolkit. And then it will also be posted on our website. So um, we're open for questions if anyone has them. Okay. Well, thank you so much for a very comprehensive discussion in a short period of time of a very complicated topic. And, and thank you for doing such a wonderful, sensitive presentation on this. Thank, thank, thank you, Paula. Thank you to everybody that joined. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, thank. Rita, Paula, and all of the participants. Thank you for, um, for being part of the discussion. And see you next month. See you okay, and Ellen, we all send you our wishes. Thank you. Bye.